Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com or look for us on Facebook at Voices from the Bench. Greetings and welcome to episode 142 of Voices from the Bench. My name is Elvis. My name is Barbara. How's it going? Going pretty good. How about yourself, Barb? Eh, been better. Yeah? What's going on? I hear uh, we got to talk about Barb's broken toe. Yeah, I fractured my sesamoid bone underneath my toe. Running, I guess. I don't know. Repetitive motion. Could barely walk. And I'm like, something's wrong. So I went to the doctor and certainly, of course, I have an issue with my toe. And I've never had any issues my whole freaking life. But now... I do. Is this your first broken bone? It's my first broken anything. I don't, yeah. Wow. How'd you get it so long in life without breaking something? I don't know, but it's not <laughs> very good and I'm not very happy. So I'm going to go join a gym and start biking for a month until my toe heals and I can go back to running. So yeah, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but runners are notoriously stupid where (laughs) we will run and then something will hurt. And we figure the best way to get over that hurt is to keep running. Pretty much. Yeah. It's like, oh, my knee hurts. And then I'll go for a run. I'm like, why does my knee hurt still? (laughs) (laughs) Yep. You're going to run it out. There's nothing wrong with me. That's my mentality. Well, uh, then you can barely walk. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm in sneakers. It's all wrapped up. It's fantastic. Yeah. Wake up in the morning, can't walk. You're like, eh, by afternoon, it doesn't feel so bad. So you go for a run. And then in the next day, you wonder why it still hurts. (laughs) Yeah. Only coming from a fellow runner could you even possibly understand that, which is super crazy. But yeah. Well, what's also funny is, you know, lab technicians are kind of the same way. They do something in the lab. It works. And they keep doing it that way until it doesn't work. And sometimes they keep doing it in the way that they know it doesn't work, but they keep doing it. You know, that's well said. I do have to agree with you on that, too. You're right. That's definitely uh, how we roll. So having that mentality of the runner and the dental technician in your brain, you're never going to heal. Nope. I'm in trouble. (laughs) Come on with the episode, Mr. Negative. Let's go. This week, we talk about an important, much-needed, and underappreciated hero within every dental lab. No, it's not a fancy mill. Nope, it's not even a printer. It is, of course, the lab production software. Oh, yeah. This important software that allows technicians to work productively and efficiently. Richard Picard from Aventrix comes on the podcast to talk about LabTrack. Now, I've been using LabTrack ever since I got into the industry a little over 12 years ago. And since I'm not the -the on-the-bench technician... I spend a majority of my day in front of lab track. I can't tell you how many hours I spend with this software. Now, Barb uses it. Yes, we do. As we find out in this interview, many labs around the world. So Richard comes on to talk about the history of bringing one of the first lab production softwares to our profession, how it works, why it works when you let it work, and what they are working on for the future of lab production. Now, most labs couldn't work without a software that keeps everything moving, keeping track of all the cases coming in and all the cases going out. So join us as we chat with Richard Picard to find out how we can do all of that and more, more efficiently. Hey, Barbara, have you heard about Oradent and their new partnership? You mean Up 3D, Elvis? Exactly. The new P5 milling machine by Up 3D. Is it another private label milling machine on the market? Actually, no. That's the cool thing. Up 3D actually manufactures their own mills. Wow, that's awesome. What is the P5 milling machine offering? Well, for starter, the P5 is a 5-axis efficient dry mill. All right, so that's super ideal and totally convenient, but what about the quality of the milling? Well, it boasts software that produces high precision and fast milling. It can mill a crown, get this, in 14 minutes. And the tool life yields about 60 to 80 hours of quality restorations. Wow, that must be super expensive software, do tell. The cam nasting software is included at no additional cost. Come on, that's a super great cost savings for any lab. 
budget friendly without compromising any of the performance. All right, so let's talk about price. Well, the funny thing is it retails for only $18,000. Wow, that's a super game changer for labs of all sizes, big and small. Under 20 k a small lab can now do their own milling instead of outsourcing. But don't forget the medium and larger labs can benefit big time from this too. The UP3D recently opened a home office in California near Oradent. So does that mean the mill ships from California and the remote technical support is also in California? Yes, Barbara, you are correct. All right. Obviously, as <laughs> always, they are both in the United States in Southern California. All you got to do is call our friends over at Oradent. 1-800-422-7373. Or you can visit their website at Oradent.com. We appreciate your support of the podcast, Oradent. Thank you. Voices from the Bench. The Interview. Well, we'd like to welcome to the podcast today a gentleman who's kind of a behind the scenes in the lab. And really, I have a love and hate relationship with your product, sir. We have Richard Picard. Is it Picard? If you're from England, it's pronounced Picard. Picard. Picard, yes. Picard. So Richard Picard from Adventrix, the makers of the LabTrack production software. How are you, sir? I'm very good, Elvis. Thank you very much. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Good. I mentioned the introduction. I have a love-hate relationship with LabTrack. You did, which, which is making me nervous. Don't I worry know, about I know. it. We started with that. Jeez. <laughs> I have to say that at our lab, I've only known LabTrack. There's a handful of softwares out there that run production within labs. But for 12 years, I've only known LabTrack. And 12 years. Yeah. So when we talk a lot about, you know, three shape design and mesh mixer, for me, LabTrack is my software I spend 10 hours a day in front of. So that's my love hate. I love it. Yes. But boy, do I spend a lot of time with it. So, Richard, thanks for coming on. Sorry about the terrible introduction. <laughs> it's fine. Don't worry. It's a pleasure. <laughs> but I wanted to kind of get the story of how LabTrack came to be. I mean, did you come from a lab background? No, I no, I didn't. Not at all. The short version of the story I'll try and give you is basically I, I was one of three brothers with a father who was a very good lawyer, who defense lawyer. Okay. And he wanted three professional sons. So he wanted a lawyer, an architect, and an accountant. Wow. Um, From the age of four or five, I was told I was going to be the accountant. Oh, that's fun. (laughs) And he got what he wanted. He got three sons. One became a lawyer. One became a a very well-regarded architect in London. Mm -hmm. And I became the boring accountant. That's (laughs) that's That's what I did. So, yeah. So nothing to do with dental labs at all. Nothing to do with them. So how did you find your way to uh, the dental laboratory industry? So I realized fairly soon after uh, working as an accountant that I hated it. <laughs> I thought you were going to say I, that. I, I, didn't, I didn't like the people very much, and I didn't like the job. The only one bit of the job that I did that I, I loved doing was I got asked to be on the fraud investigation squad. Oh. Um, and it was for a big multinational firm of accountants called Binder Diker Otter. I don't know if you've heard of BDO, but they're, they're still around now. Mm-hmm. And they used to send me on these trips all over the UK investigating potential fraud. Oh. I used to do things like go to the Outer Hebrides and climb up oil tanks and have to dip a dipstick in and measure the oil. And on one particular day, on one particular day, I climbed up this tank, measured the oil, climbed down. It was raining. And the site manager called me over and made me a cup of tea, took me into his cabin. What I didn't know was in the background, they were turning the taps. Oh. And emptying one oil tank and and filling up another one. Mm. And then I'd go to that one, and that one would be full. But I clocked on to what they were doing, and I went to another one without having another cup of tea, and it was empty. And we discovered that they'd been overcounting their inventory by billions of dollars for years. Really? So I used to love. I used to love that job. Then I got headhunted to work for a big bank, and set up a software division for the bank that was selling 
business solutions to their customers. Okay. Mm. From there, I was headhunted again to work for a private company, again, selling business solutions, finance packages and things like that to their customers. So I was making a living, but not necessarily found my vocation yet. And then one particular day, a close friend of mine said, hey, I found a business that I'm interested in investing in. Would you be interested in investing in it too? So we bought a software company. Mm -hmm. It was called Mantech back then, which was 25 years ago. It was developing and supplying software for manufacturing, very large engineering companies, manufacturing turbine engines and things like that. Mm -hmm. But the core fundamentals were sort of handling production, making sure that this lump of metal was delivered as an engine on time to British Aerospace or whoever it was. Okay. So we got involved in that. The software was very powerful and very good at what it did. And then the first dental lab approached me probably about three years later. I was aged about 30 at the time when I set up on my own. And basically this dental lab at the time, they don't exist anymore. Uh, We're all familiar with what's happened in the dental industry, but this lab, they employed about 200 technicians at the time. Wow. And everything was very manual. Everything was obviously very traditional. Digital workflow hadn't come in then. Sure. And this this owner wanted to be able to look at his technicians every day and know who was being productive and know who wasn't. So we... That's genius. Yeah, he contracted us to develop a system. The first system was called LabTrack. It was developed using Microsoft Access, of all things. Wow. Back in the day. But it very quickly became the only product in the UK dental lab market that did what a dental lab needed. Interesting. So within the space of about five years, pretty much every dental lab in the UK bought it. Hmm. Wow. So was there any other software on the market at that time? No. So everybody was doing, you always hear about those labs that do like paper, they hand write. Oh, yeah. They have a ticketing system. Everybody was doing that at this point? Yeah, and and we sort of started the revolution of software, lab management software, not only in the UK, but when I came over to the States as well, I think we really started people thinking about what they should be doing as opposed to what they'd always been doing in the past. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. So the core focus was looking at Dental Lab in the UK, what it did, how it managed its workflow, but also trying to look at the technician and trying to make their life easier. Because what you'd hear typically as a technician in the lab would be complaining about one day they'd be asked to do overtime and then the next day they'd be sent home at lunchtime. Yeah. And they wanted a standard, predictable workflow every day. So that's what we tried to achieve with scheduling the work to technicians, managing workflow and making sure that they had the right volume of work every day, but still guaranteeing those jobs got delivered on time back to the doctor. So. Mm. That's what we sort of got involved in. I spent a lot of time with a couple of labs in the UK looking at what they needed and then going back to base and developing what they needed. So that's how I got started. How long ago was that? That was 25 years ago, Barbara. Wow. I know I'm ashamed of that. (laughs) Uh, It's a long time. Um, But yeah, 25 years ago. So I remember when you first came to our laboratory and you said, what is it? Scheduling? Scheduling. Yeah, scheduling. (laughs) <laughs> I still to this day will say that and refer to you. So uh, yes, with yes, okay, <laughs> very good, very in good. a good way, in a good way. <laughs> it's a good thing to be known for. <laughs> yeah, and I think in fairness that sh- the whole scheduling concept of managing the production steps in the lab, sort of, we introduced, I think, because everybody yeah. prior to that, and there were lab management systems in in North America that, you know, we we looked at and compared what we did to, they all basically effectively bookkeeping systems. They're taking a case through the door, they're scheduling it through the lab, but they're not managing whether it's done on the day it should have been done or not. It was still a black hole. And I think we sort of brought in a whole new concept, which is dynamic scheduling. Mm. Yeah. Expand on that, would you? I personally know, but our listeners might not. So kind of go into that a little bit. There's inherent problems, Barbara, as you know, with dynamic scheduling. But the Mm -hmm. the concept behind dynamic scheduling is that as long as a technician tells a system, interacts with a system and is willing to interact with a system, then during the day, we know exactly where that production 
step or that case is in the lab. Mm -hmm. We know who's finished it last. We know where it is, where it was last. We know where it's going. And we know where the person who next receives that case or has to work on that case um, starts it. Hmm. And obviously, it's, it's moving to a digital workflow, so there's fewer hands involved. But now, instead of hands, it's printers and milling machines. Hmm. But the concept's the same. But it, to benefit from dynamic scheduling, you really need compliance. Oh, tell me about yes. that. That's the hardest part. And getting a technician to do anything requires buy-in from them. Yeah, agree. So that's the big challenge for dynamic scheduling. But the core fundamental concept is right. The lab needs to know... What cases today are running behind schedule? What cases today are on time? Hmm. Which doctors do I need to be scared of when they call? Because I can't tell them the truth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know anything about that. Yeah, we, we all know a lot about that. And that's what we introduced into the North American market. Obviously, the products evolved since, and there's things we'll talk about today that will give you an insight into where we're going. But that was the start of, of what we did. So when did you move to North America? So you started it in England. So that was 25 years ago. When did you come to the States? So I came to the States about 15 years ago. Okay. We incorporated in Boston, Massachusetts, Ooh. which I loved. It was a, yeah. great, a great fun city. Yeah. And we started the work of developing a new version of LabTrack for the North American market because the labs over here are significantly different in terms of their needs, wants and wishes compared to a, a dental lab in the UK. Yeah, we're a little high maintenance. Uh, yes that's one way of saying it so what changed i mean the lab track i look at now that barb and i both stare at daily how is that different than when it started 25 years ago the lab track you look at now the whole sort of principle that we've followed all the way through from the beginning of starting here is that we have to listen to customers' needs and that the product has to develop around those needs because it helps. I can't think of everything and I don't think of everything. So I can't tell you what you need. I need you to tell me what you need and then we'll look at developing it as a solution. So over the years, the products evolved and evolved and evolved because of customers like Barbara and like you, Elvis, although less like you, Elvis, because... <laughs> I know we've been. You, you tend to use what you've got and not pushers, but other customers like Barbara's <laughs> Lab and, and others since get quite demanding, but for the right reasons. They just want to become more efficient and more profitable. Yeah. And we're there to try and help that happen. Mm-hmm. The whole principle behind what we do is not delivering a package like QuickBooks and saying, here you go, that's it, and it'll never change. Yeah. We want to be there for you next year and in, in, in 10 years' time with whatever's needed for you then. Yeah. And you definitely are. I can say that because when you refer to us as that way, you know, there's tons of reports that we've asked you guys to do for us that we needed to manage our laboratory and your customer service is amazing. We've been able to create reports to make us manage the laboratory better and faster. And and it's just been a great experience. So hats off to you. Thanks for saying that, Barbara. I can't say every person who signed a check and bought LabTrack would say the same. (laughs) But it's that disappointment typically comes from lack of commitment from the lab because it, you know, Barbara, as well as I do, it's a a huge commitment to introduce a a full blown lab management system into a lab. Yeah, A lot of work has to go into it. A lot of people have to buy into it and to make it do what it's supposed to do. How long have you been using it, Barb? Gosh, Richard, five, six years, maybe? Yeah, I'd say five or six years. Yeah, five or six years. And do you have an employee dedicated to running LabTrack? Uh, We've got two. Oh, really? Okay. Manage the dates and manage where the cases are, make sure that the late cases, either, you know, they refresh them or, or move them. But we try to get around 50 or less late cases a day. Um, but, yeah, it's a full-time job for a couple people. But, oh, you know, sure. It's five, 600 cases going through here a day. Yeah. By the way, I looked today, Barbara. Uh-oh. You had about 24, I think. That is really good, Which, right? I remember you your, telling us that. <laughs> based on your volume, it was a less than 1%. Yeah, and if you really focus on that number, then you know, and I know that from you, that you're yeah. managing the software correctly, which is Correct. awesome. Correct. Yeah. It means that technicians are actually complying and they're, mm-hmm. they're doing what they need to do to tell the system to be accurate. Exactly. That's awesome, Barbara. And, and if we can get every lab doing that, then awesome. But it, it's a challenge, as you know. Yeah. yeah. When you first go into the laboratory, you have to actually physically sit down with the laboratory management and s- schedule how many hours 
each step is going to take so that it accurately moves through the laboratory. And that in itself, I think, is one of the hardest things, trying to figure out where your breaks are, where your steps are. I'm certain that you go into every single laboratory and have to do that exercise. We do. and But over the years, what we've been able to do is sort of build up a library of standard templates. I'll, I'll use the word template mm-hmm. and explain it, which is just a build up of the production steps that manufacture a crown or whatever it is that, that we're trying to schedule through the lab. So we have sort of master libraries that we can go to a lab and say, here you are. If everything that you're looking at is perfect, then they literally can be up and running and live very quickly. But nice. typically, typically labs are not like that. The way that you manufacture a crown is very different from the way another lab manufactures a crown, or at least the steps they want to record and make accountable are. Yeah. So every lab has to change the standard to whatever fits them. And that, yeah. that's their challenge. Yes, it is. Some labs we go to, they've already done time and motion studies. They already have a good idea. You know, this takes 10 minutes. This takes 15 minutes. This takes 20 seconds or whatever it is. But yeah. other labs haven't got a clue. Yeah, big time. And it's, it's quite a good way for the lab of actually getting an understanding of their core fundamentals by going through that process. Because how can you know where your capacity is? How can you know where your opportunities are to grow? If you don't know how long it takes to make the things that are in there now. Yeah, it really opens your eyes when you're just trying to build the templates to figure out like, wow, each step takes so long. And you talk to the technicians to figure out how long they think it takes and how long management thinks it should take. It really opens eyes. (laughs) Yeah. Technicians are like, yeah, it takes me two hours. Management's like, no, it should take you about 20 minutes. Yeah. The truth is, Barbara's lab is slightly different from the typical lab in terms of size and volume. But every lab who has LabTrack needs not to forget that LabTrack, once it's set up, needs to be kept up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the technicians come and go, new product lines come in, new procedures are introduced, and all of those need to be fed in to LabTrack in order for it to be able to continue to tell you the truth. Yeah. So every lab who has LabTrack needs to do that and if they don't if they let it go it doesn't take long before everything starts to not make sense in terms of the scheduling and the the power that it has yeah so it's it's a it's not a full-time job if someone regularly keeps it up to date but it you know it becomes one very quickly if they don't i get that i tell you what the hardest thing that our laboratory had to accept was not putting a due date on the on the work ticket yeah Oh my God, you would have thought somebody died in this laboratory. We had so many, so many people upset about that, but you can't use the system correctly. If you go by the date, if anything changes and it reschedules, then everything shifts. And so that was a huge shift in the dynamic of the way that we uh, ran the company at the time, but that was really hard for us. And, and how's that gone since? I mean, have you put due dates back on or are you still working without due we dates? Have due on? dates on some and then not due dates on others. So it just, okay. like the implant is a separate department and they have to have them on there. But yeah, we're, we're still doing it. I mean, the intent behind not needing a due date or at least trying to, to not necessarily make it obvious to a technician the due date of a case is to try and stop them picking their own work yes. yeah. and, and to try and get them to work within a system as opposed to outside of the system. Mm. And, and not all labs embrace dropping due dates off cases for, for technicians, but, you know, the, the labs who people like BJ at Roe, uh, you know, yeah, BJ yeah. very well, I think yeah. people like that embrace it because they know it makes them more efficient. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know. We have to work with all kinds of labs, and some it works for, some it doesn't. What do you guys do, Elvis? So when you schedule a case, for those that don't use LabTrack, you get a sheet of paper that, I guess, default is shows the date it needs to go out the door, and at the bottom has a list of every step you've associated with that product and what date that step should be done. Yes. So, Barb, you eliminated the date It needs to go out, but it still has the steps? Yes, that's correct. But the steps don't necessarily have to have a date associated with them Mm -hmm. because what you don't want to do is have to reprint that work ticket every day. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Because the whole core fundamental behind the scheduler is it's a look at every case in the lab every day 
and make decisions itself using the algorithms it's got that we know work because we've been doing this for so long. Yeah. And basically say, look, based on what I know and the workload that I have and the capacity available to me today, based on the technicians in the lab physically now, as opposed to those in general who may be or may not be here, but the ones who are actually here, I know what I need to do now today. And I I can move certain cases out to start tomorrow because they don't have to get done today. And I need to move certain cases in today because they do have to get done today to keep on time. So if the Hmm. schedule is allowed to do its job, it'll move cases around to make the lab the most efficient it possibly can. But then the whole idea is you need the technicians to work off that new list and not just pick cases based on a whim. Where do they get that daily list if it's not on the scheduling ticket? So every technician, when they walk into the lab, there's two ways that we do it. But the way I would, I like people to do it if they can, but it does involve an investment in hardware, is for technicians to have access to touchscreen. Mm -hmm. That gives them a list of every case in their department that needs to get done today. And obviously, every day it changes. It will order that list too, based on priority. So if there's five technicians, it becomes a rush case. Five technicians have to work on this case today. It'll put that at the top of the list. So they do that first. So the other technicians aren't waiting for it. Ah. So we have that, Elvis. So we did invest in the touchscreen. We got everybody a iPad. And so it brings it up and you've got 20 cases in front of you. And it'll actually show you the priority and which one you have to do first, which one you have to do second and then so on and so forth. So it actually manages their day for them via the um, touchscreen. Every technician has a touchscreen? Yeah. Whoa. (laughs) Yeah, there's about 100 of them. Yeah. Yeah, some labs don't invest in that level of hardware. Others do. Barbara's not the only lab who've put screens in front of every technician. There's many who have. Sure. And there are huge benefits because then the technician's compliance is made easier. They don't have to get off their chair. They can continue working, and they just use their finger to say, hey, I've got this case, this case, this case now, and hey, I've finished that one and that one now. Yeah. Yeah. So the challenge has always been compliance, getting technicians Mm -hmm. to do what they need for the system, but also continue being efficient and working. Yeah. The way we have it set up is we have a couple laptops stationed around the lab where people would what we call book on and book off of cases. And getting them to go and do it, it's always been a struggle. And I can see the benefit of putting something right in front of them so they don't have to get up and do it. So in in the future, I'm going to change that too. We'll talk about future a little bit more, Yeah, I'm sure. But one of the things I've been working very passionately on over the last couple of years is developing a system that will take away the need for a technician to be involved with a system at all. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. But we'll still know that they had the case and we'll still know that when they started it and we'll still know when they finished it. Wow. Ooh, that sounds exciting. Yeah, that's coming. Yeah. It'll also, Barbara, solve the problem of when you get a call from a doctor saying, can you tell me where my case is up to? Mm. And then someone in the lab has to go and find that case. That's where I get my steps in. Sounds to me like it's a chip, something chip related, but all right. Yeah, I would agree with you. This will literally tell you hey, go and find it. It's in room number three within three feet of the corner of the room. That's awesome. But the beauty behind it as well is it will also tell you the historic flow of cases of certain restoration types through the lab. Mm -hmm. So you can start to see where where the bottlenecks are created simply because of movement as opposed to people. Really? Yeah, it's a a huge opportunity, I think, for most sort of medium-sized labs and above. Yeah. I get about two miles a day walking around looking for cases. Yeah, well, I mean, I've I've been to labs where the production stops until they find the case. Yeah. Yeah. Entirely. People see me walking around, what are you looking for? And I tell them the number, then three other people are looking for the pan, and oh, yeah, I can totally see the benefit. So what you'll be able to do, Elvis, is pull out your cell phone and enter the case PAN number or the case number or the patient name or the doctor name, and it will draw you a picture of where it is in the lab. That's wow. Awesome. How do you come up with, do you have like a team of people, of innovators that come up with this? I'm sure you're included, but like, how do you keep yourself so advanced? That particular development is for good or for bad entirely me. <laughs> um, not as a developer, but as the, I suppose the idea person. That yeah. It's something I've wanted to do for a long time. Technology is just about there now where it, we can actually make it happen. Hmm. So the old technology that you may think it's related to, it's not, is too expensive for a a typical lab to implement. So it's using some new technology that's just come out. Wow. Yeah. 
I will say, before we get too much farther, when it comes yep. to, Barbara mentioned teams, calling you guys with a question or an issue, phenomenal job yeah. at getting back to us and taking care of things and people being spot on and you know having a relationship with the people behind the software is one of the benefits of it yeah, yeah. you got so many good people there yeah we do I've, I've been really lucky that i've kept really good people too i mean everybody who works at inventrix has been with us for a number of years some people have been with me since i started over here wow so they're all amazing people i mean during covid obviously we've all had to work remotely yeah many people told me you need to put software on the machines to make sure that they're working efficiently to make sure you're not paying them for when they're not working i don't have to do that because they all work hard every day and always have and always will yeah Mm. so i've got no worries about my staff they're all fantastic yeah to just go back to that point it's one thing i'm extremely passionate about for good or for bad is customer service and not selling widgets to people it's not my game i've never wanted to i don't believe in selling a piece of software to somebody and not being there for them afterwards yeah so it's how we will always be whatever platform lab track ends up on we will not be a sort of cloud-based provider unavailable unwilling to help yeah we will always be driven by customer service because unlike most of the labs that, that are customers of ours, we don't have a sales force. We don't have anyone selling lab track. Mm-hmm. And I'm quite a shy person at heart, so I don't even go to most of the shows. Typically, I go to the midwinter. Yeah, we see you at Cal Lab, right? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm typically there every year. Obviously, not next year, but typically I am. Yeah. But we we sell by people talking and by customers recommending us because of what we do and because of the support we provide. Mm-hmm. And that's that's how we've always grown. And that's true because I've been on Facebook sites and, you know, every now and again, somebody will ask a question, you know, what software do you use? And, you know, you've got a number of people that will go on there and say, we use LabTrack and, you know, are super positive about it. And I can see the ripple effect where, you know, how we are in the dental community. You know, yep. you listen to somebody that says something positive about a company and or a product and you want to investigate and see it. So yep. I could definitely see where that would be a, a referral for you guys. Yeah. So it's a passion of ours that we want to do a good job. We we believe in very much like as a human being, you want to be able to look yourself in the mirror every day and say, I've, I've done good today. I've not yeah. hurt anybody. I've been a good person. We, well, we want to be a good company and yeah. do the right thing by people every day. That's that's how we were founded. And it's how I want to always be moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. It shows. It shows with your staff. Yeah, it does. It's not just medium and large labs that use LabTrack. Do you have a lot of smaller operations that use it? Yeah, we do. And we'll talk about, again, the future sh- coming yeah. up. But in terms of our historic path, it's really been LabTrack Enterprises has historically been a, a sort of enterprise system. If you, Barbara knows this all too well, and so do you, Elvis, to, to, some, to a lesser degree, but you still know it, that there's a lot of commitment and a lot of work that has to go into developing the solution for you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You have to set up all your products, all your templates, all your steps. And as we've talked earlier, those differ for every lab who buys LabTrack. So there's a lot of commitment involved and needed by the lab. So typically we can't really sell to the guy who wants to buy a hundred dollar a month system yeah because the lab tracks not for them they wouldn't need it anyway they don't maybe they only have you know 50 cases in the lab on any given day or any given week yeah again lab tracks not needed at that level it power of lab track is when you've got more cases than you can cope with yeah 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 i get that bingo yeah. <laughs> so historically, we have got a number of small labs who've bought LabTrack because they see what it can do and they want to grow and they want to get a system in place before they grow so that those standards and procedures and compliance issues are all gone by the time that they do grow. And so we have a number of labs who are small, mm-hmm. but typically it's medium size and above. Sure. What do you consider medium, like 30 or more? I would say any, any lab who sort of have 25 technicians or above, I would class as a medium sort of size yeah, lab. Yeah, agree. And then we've got some labs who are boutique labs in New York, in, in Manhattan, who there's only one tech, effectively. Yeah. But he still wanted lab track because he st- still saw the benefits of having his work scheduled for him and, and managing his workflow. That's cool. Yep. So it takes all kinds. And then at the other end of the scale, we, we've got customers all over the world now. We've got customers in Australia, in Asia, in obviously in Europe where my UK company is based 
in Saudi Arabia, of all places, as well. Really? Wow. Yeah. We just actually won a contract in Saudi Arabia for the Ministry of Health. Saudi Arabia, they all their public entities like Ministry of Health and the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, they all have their own hospitals dedicated to that service. Uh-huh. Ministry of Health has 41 hospitals. Every hospital has a dental wing and every dental wing has a lab. Interesting. Wow. So we've just been awarded a, a huge contract with Saudi Arabia to implement lab track in 41 dental labs for the Ministry of Health. Wow. Which will be an interesting project. Yeah, how do you tackle something like that? I, mean, I was wow. just going to do that. Yeah. You have to have local distributors who are there to do the local work. So we've got those in place. We've got a couple of distributors in Saudi who they'll in, sort of install and implement lab track. So we're just the back desk support team, really, for them. Wow. wow. You got to translate the whole language of the system. No, no, no. They, they use it as it is. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And then we've obviously got contracts with the Ministry of Defense here. So the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, oh. the VA hospitals all use lab track too. I had no idea. Wow. And your dad wanted you to be an accountant. <laughs> my dad wanted me to be an accountant. Yeah. yeah. Well, he's no longer here now, so I can do what I want. Can't I? <laughs> there you go. God bless him. Yeah. Yep. That's exciting. I had no idea you guys were, I mean, I knew you were big all over, but not all over. Wow. It's exciting with the Department of Defense because we've now got, for the Army, every single dental case for the entire Armed Services Army is now going through lab track. Well, how many cases do they do a day? <laughs> a lot. A lot. I bet. A lot. Yeah. A lot. yeah. So those cases are being submitted by the clinics wherever they are in the world, Afghanistan or wherever they're based. And they're they're all being funneled through LabTrack Connect down to Fort Gordon, which is the core US-based yep. dental lab. And they have LabTrack. And we're just about, I think, in the coming year to be implementing in Germany too for the army. Wow. I could see where that would be a huge benefit. They've suddenly got digital workflow. They never had yeah. it before. Wow. Well, don't forget about us little labs. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. You're everything to me, Elvis. <laughs> You know that. I don't mean just you. I mean labs like yeah. you. Yep. So, yes. Yeah, so, so it's an exciting time for us. There's lots going that on. It is exciting. Yeah. So you alluded to all the, the uh, changes and the yeah, upgrades and all of that. I know you talked about the one, but what else is going on? I gather that BJ Kowalski yes. mentioned something to you oh, yeah. on, a, on a prior podcast, I think, about um, digital workflow, something that I didn't mind him mentioning. It was fairly early on in the day. Um, when he mentioned Mm -hmm. it, but I'll try and bring you up to speed a little. I do have to just not say too much because it's, I think the power of it is so big that I just need to make sure that we have an opportunity to be first to market. Um, But basically what we've developed with my very close relationship with our UK company, and to give you a bit of background, the UK company who are distributor of LabTrack in, in Europe, they purchased a dental lab. Okay. And basically, it's a full digital workflow lab. Mm-hmm. They're also a distributor of 3Shape. Oh, wow. Okay. So they started selling 3Shape equipment um, to practices and built a very strong relationship with 3Shapes. So much so that what we basically did was said, look, you're providing a great service to the dentist, but we're concerned about the lab. You need to come to our lab and you need to see the workflow that we have to go through, the pain we have to go through every day to manage this digital workflow. Mm -hmm. And something has to change. So they were extremely good about it through shape. They came from Denmark and sat down in front of us and saw the workflow that we had to go Mm -hmm. through. And wow. you know this all too well, don't you? That yes. you, get a, you get a case from Three Shape, for example. I'm talking about all of them now, but mm-hmm. Three Shape. Let's say you get an email saying, "Hey, you've got a new case. You have to log on to Three Shape Communicate. You have to download and print the printable order form. You have to then download the STL files. You have to manually enter the case in LabTrack. You then have to go to the desktop design software and manually enter it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's for one case. Yeah. So the minute you get 50 cases a day which you probably already have, Barbara, don't you? At least, oh, I would yeah. think. Oh, yeah. Imagine how much time that takes. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. What we've developed is a cloud-based portal called iOS Connect. Hmm. It talks to all the iOS vendors' systems. Cool. So to give you an example, if you're a three-shape lab, you log in with your three-shape communicate account. 
it goes away and it talks to 3Shape and it pulls down into the portal all your relationships, all your accepted relationships. It then goes back to 3Shape and it talks to 3Shape again and it says, hey, send me all your cases that are being submitted to this lab. And they all come down into the portal Mm. at the same time as that you get the email, but now you don't need the email. Mm. So the portal is a real-time bucket for all your digital workflow. You look at the case, if you're happy with it, you click a button and it inputs that case into into LabTrack directly. Wow. So there's no case entry to do. There's no downloading of digital files to do. And it also sends that case file to the back end to your design software too. And it doesn't have to be three-shaped design software either. Wow. So that's a major development for us. We've currently plugged in three-shape, Itero. We're just about to add Medit, CareStream, PlanMecca, and Serona. Oh, wow. That's wow. the big ones all right there. That's a fairly major development. Great. And, and it's all driven because of the need for the lab. We know your pains. I've known them for years. That it's obviously you're you're trying you're fighting so hard to keep customers every day because there's so many people offering cheap crowns mm. or whatever they're offering. You get the rough end of the stick all the time. Uh, so we're here to try and make that as bearable as possible and make you as efficient as possible. So we wouldn't have to log into Medit and Itero nope. and all those nope. where you spend half a day. Nope. That's awesome. And you miss the cases and you miss the comments and you miss the files. So all of that goes away. You can't miss a thing because it's all coming into one bucket. That's awesome. Yeah, I do find where we miss things, that's for sure, especially in that arena. Yeah. So when is that happening? Next week? Well, it's, it's, ha- <laughs> it's happening now. We've rolled it out to seven labs so yeah. far. Nice. We started off with, uh, and funny enough, it, it's, it's been a strange experience, COVID, uh, for us. We've picked up more new customers this year than ever before. Well, people had time during their furlough to kind of reassess how they're doing production. Yeah, well, funnily enough, probably two thirds of those labs are brand new labs. Oh. In other words, they've recognized an opportunity to set up during the quiet time, get everything in place, and they're launching now as we speak. Interesting. That's great to hear. A lot of startup labs. And these startup labs have heard about what we've done with three shape and others so it's been a very logical first step for them they're literally going from nothing to a fully digital workflow on day one wow that's the way to do it (laughs) if you're going to do one now that's definitely the way to do it so yes so that's it's been exciting there's there's some other developments that we're in the process of and i think again i think bj mentioned one of them i think you're trialing it now barbara aren't you the integration with zimbus I do believe we are. Yeah, I think you are. So the whole principle behind what we do is I don't believe in reinventing wheels. If there's something out there that does a good job and will help you, I'd rather integrate with it than try and copy it. Yeah. Yeah. So Zimbus is an integration that we've done that that works really well. We've been working with a couple of vendors on a digital wallet for your iPhone or Android phone that allows you to communicate directly with your doctor. Mm. So that's going to come out soon. Other customers with their mobile apps. We've done a a brand new integration with UPS and FedEx, which you're just about to to start using, Barbara. You may not know about it, but this allows you to, when you're invoicing the case, it'll print off the shipping label at the same time. Yeah. Pull that shipping label back into LabTrack, and then it'll also give you tracking information real time on all the packages you've sent. Um, And if there's any delays, it'll tell you. Yeah, that's super important. I've been in the shipping department helping and you got to click this and you got to do this and then you got to do that. And that's that's yeah. going to be a time saver. Yeah, I think quite a big time saver yeah. for you guys. And I think for other labs like BJ Rowe and others like you, it's going to be a huge benefit. Why is Barb getting yeah. all the hook up? How come I'm not getting the UPS integration? <laughs> you are because you ship 700 packages out of here a day and that's going to save hours and hours and hours and we're always like hello richard can you help us with this this is not the benefit for you elvis is that a lab like barbara's lab they'll talk to me about what they need we'll develop what they need we'll make it work the way they need it to work and then i can come back to you elvis at the next user group meeting which i'm going to do online using zoom this year and it's i'm planning it being in november but i can then say hey elvis we have a module now that you can have that integrates UPS directly with their API. 
So I can't give it to you at the same time because we go through that process with the labs who ask for it or involved in its development. What he's trying to say is that we're super high maintenance. <laughs> yes. And we're constantly on the phone trying to tell them, how can we help us? But I'd rather have a high maintenance lab though, Barbara, because it pushes us and yeah. I want to be pushed. I don't yep. want to sit back and think that we wear everything to everybody because that's when we'll fail. Well, Barb, I would also prefer for you to do the trial and error and You're just jealous. work out all the bugs. And once you've perfected <laughs> it, then we'll take it on. So. All right. In the last few minutes of this, uh, just to give you an understanding of sort of the new technologies that we're involved in yeah. doing, I'll, I'll try and describe a vision to you, if you like. Yes. And the vision is that is this, that ultimately there's one core product that all interested parties in the dental world log into. Hmm. Whether it be a dentist, it be a technician, it be a lab owner, a lab manager, it be a third party vendor, Mm -hmm. like all of those requirements of all of those people become one system. Yeah. Because if you think about it at the moment, what you have is you have disparate systems to solve different people's problems. You have a cloud based portal for a doctor to log into to submit cases. You have lab track for a lab to log into to report on their own information. But but in that information is also the doctor information that you'd ideally like to give to them and that you're having to do now with DSOs anyway. Yeah. Hmm. So why not have one system with all of that data in it that everybody has access to, but at different levels based on need? The doctor logs in, they can submit a case. The doctor logs in and he can do reporting on his data. The DSO logs in and can report on multiple doctors, multiple regions or single offices or single accounts. The lab technician logs in and they see their production requirement for today. So instead of having four or five different systems trying to solve four or five users' needs, why not have a system that does it all within one? So that's what I'm working towards. And we're slowly bolting on those effectively modules into one system. So we're working on lab track. We're working on the iOS side. We're working on the cloud-based portal side for the doctor who doesn't use three shape, but still wants to submit cases your way or still wants to track his cases. Mm -hmm. And ultimately these are all going to be incorporated into one core product with the same look and feel, the same data, but given to different people based on need. Yeah. Wow. So Barbara first and then everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> you know it. Actually, I think BJ first and then possibly. Well, I don't know. There are others, you know. It's not. <laughs> it, BJ doesn't get everything. Yes, but he does. But to, to be fair to BJ, though, he has some really good ideas. Yeah. And he's very brave at dipping into new technology, yep. which is awesome because it helps drive technology oh, forward. Oh, sure. Yes. I'm very glad to have BJ on board, just as you, I am with you, Barbara. Yes. And Elvis. Um, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is eventually a dentist will be able to log in to th- their version of our lab track. Yeah, I was going to ask. They'll be logging into lab track. With limited view, obviously. They'll see their view, yeah, that you want them to yeah, see. Yeah, sure. And the DSO at head office will be logging into their lab track, the same lab track. But then what's happening is that you're presenting the data that they want to see to them. They're not seeing the day-to-day nitty-gritty of the lab, but they are seeing the information they need because all of that data is in there. They're not seeing who we're charging down the street with that price, right? No, 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 no. They're seeing what you want them to see. Yeah. And what they're interested in. You know, they're getting very demanding DSOs, yeah. aren't they, Barbara? And they're, they're, oh, yeah. So give them what they need, but give them it real time. Why produce them a report every week when they can see it today and they can see it next hour? They can see it next minute. Yeah, that's pretty cool. One system that handles the internal workings of the lab, that handles the scheduling, which needs to change too, because scheduling now is becoming to the minute, not to the day. Hmm. You know, we've got labs, 24 turnaround products. We have to be able to schedule that accurately every minute of the day for them. So there's new technologies we're bringing into play that are all going to go into one core user interface that looks the same for everybody who logs in, just providing a different set of data to those people based on need. I can't believe it. That's quite an undertaking. I can't imagine how much is on your plate. Well, we're doing it block by block. We've got two of those blocks already in place. We're just about to finish the third of those blocks. So it's, it's just coming along block by block. Yeah. How much time do you spend in Europe? That's a sore point, Barbara. (laughs) I used to fly back for the last 15 years. I've flown back every month without fail. 
there actually one time I couldn't fly because there was a Iceland volcano erupted and all the flights were grounded. Wow. But every other time for 15 years, I've flown back every month and I haven't been able to fly back to England now for nine months. Oh. Due to COVID? Yeah, due to COVID. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, And I've got two grown up boys, two beautiful boys in England that I've flown back every month to see and I haven't seen them now for nine months. Yeah. Which is hard to bear, yeah, that's but rough. I'll survive. So I haven't got on a plane since COVID started. I, I don't think it's wise to do it right now. I don't know what you think. I have not been on a plane either. So Well, we talked about that too, Elvis and I. You know, we haven't seen anybody. We haven't traveled at all. You know, that whole face-to-face -face networking that, you know, we're so great at in our industry. I think but everybody misses that. Yeah, I bet you. So if a lab was interested in seeing what LabTrack could do for them, What's a good way yep. for them to reach out and what do you provide as a show them how it can help? Pre-COVID, <laughs> yeah. every lab who's bought LabTrack in the past, I've physically got on a plane and I've gone to the lab. Yeah. Man, you traveled a lot. <laughs> yes, I have. I've done it around 2 million air miles with United Airlines. Wow. I love doing that because it gives me an understanding of them. It, we can look each other in the in the eyes and make sure that they're committed and that I am I feel comfortable with that customer coming on board because, as, as I mentioned earlier, we don't actively go out and market LabTrack. Yeah. So I need to know they're going to be a customer and they're going to be a happy customer. Therefore, I need to know that the system fits their needs. Mm -hmm. So I go to every lab. Now, obviously, I can't. So I'm doing online meetings and Zoom meetings yep. and running through the system with them and showing them. And But still trying to uncover all the things they need uh -huh. before either they commit or I commit. Because it's a two-way relationship, this. You know, all they have to do to contact us is email either myself which is richard at inventrix.us.com or info at inventrix.us.com. And I'll get an email and I'll give them a call yeah. and go from there. Have you ever met a lab that you were like, you're not ready for this? Yes. You're, yeah? Many. Really? Many. Wow. Yeah. What was the factors that made that not work? Typically, it's where a lab, the owner of the lab is also at the bench. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And they will not let go of handing out the work. Yep. And the minute that I see that, I walk away. Really interesting. Yeah, I think that's the only healthy thing to do because you're not going to change that. No, and they're never going to embrace LabTrack because LabTrack's going to wrestle with them every day saying, hang on a minute, I need to control the lab, not you anymore. <laughs> and they're, and they're going to say, no, 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 I want to give out the work. Oh, well, yeah. Well, then you might as well stay giving out the work because LabTrack won't work for you. Mm, yep. Interesting. So if, if the lab owner is progressive enough to say, look, I need to step back and let this system do its job because when it's allowed to do its job, it's going to make me more efficient and make me more money and show me where my capacity is and show me how I can grow. If they let that happen, LabTrack is worth selling to them. Yeah. And I'm committed and I'll jump in with both feet to help them. But yeah. where a lab doesn't want to do that, doesn't want to let LabTrack do its job, then I, I have to step back because it'll fail. Yeah. Interesting. And it will. I agree. Like I said, it you definitely have to change everything you do in a more positive, productive manner, but it, it's not the easiest thing to do. And you know how people fight change anyways. Um, yep. You're not open to it. The sad ones that I've turned down are the ones where the technicians love it and want it. Yeah. But the owner will not change. Yeah. It will never work because the, everybody looks at the owner as an example. And if the owner is not prepared to do what's needed, they won't either. Yeah. You know, so it does happen, Elvis. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I mean, it's smart on your end to say, you know, this is just not for you. Yeah. We've been fortunate enough that we've been able to be in that position. We've been fortunate enough that I've been able to be ethical about how we do business yeah. or at least my ethics. I'm, I'm not saying everybody's, but, but my. Yeah. yeah. So we've been fortunate. Uh, we've got great customers and that's helped us be able to stay there and, and say, look, we want to do it the right way, but we don't want to do it if it's not going to work. Yeah. Yep. Have you ever had any labs that's had this program for, you know, like us? I mean, before I even got here. So we've probably had it 15 years or so. Yeah. Have you ever had labs totally rehaul it because so much has changed in the lab? Yes. Yep. That happens on a regular basis. Yeah. Typically, Elvis, a lab like you've had it for many years. If you remember at the beginning of this, I said you have to keep it up yeah. to date. Oh, yeah. And you have to reflect in LabTrack what changes have happened in reality in the lab. And typically, 
the labs who need to rehash everything and redo it all are the labs who haven't done that. Yeah. And it gets to a point where lab track can't reflect reality anymore because the departments are wrong, the people are wrong, the products are wrong, or the steps are wrong. Hmm. So they need to go back and, and redo it again. Yeah. Yeah. But they do it because it's worth the effort because they know lab track will work. They just have to go back and press the reset button. Yeah. So, yeah, that happens regularly. We, you know, there's probably one lab, two labs a year who want to reset. I honestly, I feel like we need it here. I mean, this thing, like I said, we still have codes in here that just don't make sense anymore. (laughs) You know? Need to bite the bullet and do it. We're there to help you. You don't get charged anything. It's a support thing. So one of our support team will be there for you, tell you what you need to do. They'll help you. But ultimately, it has to be you doing the work. We can't yeah. do that work for you. I just can't get Barb to do it for me. No. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would <laughs> if you pay me. <laughs> she charges a lot more than me. Probably. <laughs> I know her. She's high maintenance. <laughs> and I, admittedly so. Thank you. Yes, so much. <laughs> So before we sign off, why is it called Adventrix? Where did that come from? Inventrix stands for the, it's a Latin word for the female side of a man's brain. Oh my God. Are you kidding me? That's brilliant. So it's the inventive side. You know, um, men are good at some things, but they're not very good at coming up with ideas. Women are. Yeah. Typically. I agree. So that's what it stands for. It's the female side of the brain, the creative inventive side. Inventrix. That is some special kind of compliment. I love that. Yeah, that's where it came from. Nice. Great question, Elvis. You just made my day. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Richard, I really enjoyed hearing the story about it. I had no idea there was that much history behind it. In here. To me, it started when I started in the lab business, and it's been a part of it ever since. And we appreciate what you guys do on the back end to help us do what we need to do and make it more efficient. I think it's cool. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. I echo that. Keep doing what you're doing, and I'm excited to see what new things you guys bring out, because it it all sounds real exciting. I think we've got a very exciting next 12 months coming up for everybody, for all our customers. I think there's some innovations that we've been involved in that are going to change the industry again, as far as the lab's concerned, their internal workings, and make them a lot more efficient than they are now. Yeah. So I'm I'm very excited. And as soon as BJ and Barb work out all the bugs, I'll be happy to I'll be happy to check it out. <laughs> all righty, Richard. We appreciate it and we will see you whenever Cal Lab happens again. Yep. Sure. And thank you so much, both of you, for your time. It's been great. Absolutely. Enjoyed it. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yep. Bye. Bye. Whitmix is now providing its milling customers with Prima milling tools, the high-performance milling tools engineered specifically for Roland Mills. This new tool range outperforms the competition. The results show that not only does the tool last 29% longer than most others, their precision creates a pinpoint accuracy ensuring a perfect fit for the patient. Whitmix's own digital technical support team said, quote, The tools are a drop-in replacement for Roland tools. So there's no need to make changes to the software to accommodate them. All of the Prima tools seem to have an exceptional life and produce a great surface finish. We recommend switching to them. The uncoated tools save up to 40% per restoration over the market leaders, but you can now save 20% on these great tools through January 10th, 2021. To take advantage of this offer, visit whitmix.com or call 1-800-626-626. 5651. And as always, we appreciate your support of the podcast, Whitmix. A big thanks to Richard for coming on the podcast and talking to us about Lab Track. I know Elvis and I were both big fans of it. I love how you guys are integrating with the digital impression companies also. It'll be a huge help to have a software that can track all of the different offices using all the different scanners and organizing it automatically. Right now, it's kind of a cluster. What were you using before LabTrack, Elvis? I don't know. I came into, you know, like I said, 12 years ago when I got it here, we were already using it. So before then, I have no idea. 
What were you using? I think it was evident, actually. Oh, interesting. And then we switched over because, you know, they just wanted to try something different. And um, we've been really happy with it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And actually, since we talked to Richard and I talk in the interview about how I needed to revamp it, I've given it a go. We've given up a lot of codes and rewrote some new stuff templates and steps and i'm trying to get it revamped so it can be more productive here again that's cool hey guys remember to head over to the dentalpodcast.org and vote for our podcast in the best dental podcast of 2020 it's easy to do and you can do it every single day let's show all of these other podcasts that the dental lab industry is strong super easy head over and vote yep All right, everybody. That's all we got. We'll talk to you next week. Bye. I was hoping to catch you. (laughs) Yeah.